wonderful. You know, we've been talking about the power of doing life together, and we're continuing to understand about that. And, and you know, if you're like me, you want to figure out what God wants for your life, you know? Uh, it's like, what, what are you after? What do you want from us? What, what are you about? And um, so Jesus reveals it to us when he's talking to his heavenly father about, you know, maybe like you and your spouse sit down sometimes and you talk about what your kids could be. You know, maybe they're four or five and you haven't messed them up yet. And they're just kind of like there and you're like, man, I really think he could be an astronaut and, or something like that. Or she's going to be a fighter pilot or whatever the ideas that you may have in your head. And you talk about and you dream together about what they could be. Well, we have a moment, a snapshot where Jesus is talking to the father about what we can be after we've been screwed up. And that God is, has an idea about what you and I can be and what, what is his desire. So he's praying in John 17, 11 to his father, and he, and he prays this incredible prayer about what he's really into. He says, Holy Father, keep them in your name, that the name which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that would be us, that they may all be one even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I and them, you and me, and that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you have loved me. That they may be one, as you and I are one. And he says it over and over and over again in this simple prayer. And then he connects all these, these benefits to it. This, this idea is that, that they may have glory so that they may be one, so that the world may know that you sent me by them being one, that everything seems to hinge on this desire of God for you and I to get along, for you and I to live life together, to be one as he is one. And so there are all kinds of ideas of what Christianity should look like. Uh, we have ideas of what a good church is, what kind of songs we're supposed to be singing, whether we hymnal, have hymnals or not, whether or not um, we do an altar call or not, whether or not we um, have seven sacraments or we have two sacraments, depending on if you're Catholic or you're Protestant. We have a lot of ideas about what a good church should be. But this is what Jesus is talking about, is a good church. Not just any kind of gathering, but that we may be one as he is one. Because together for Jesus has an ethos, it has a culture, it has a life to it, it has truth to it. Because God's love is unconditional, his love is relentless, it's sacrificial, it's giving, it's personable, it's all these things. And he's like, I want them to be one just as we are one. Because we can be one in the wrong way. And I, you know, have you ever found yourself in a one relationship or conversation or a dinner engagement where you're now one, you're sitting there talking with somebody and you're not talking about what you're supposed to be talking about. And all of a sudden you're one, you're maybe a couple of couple, couples going out to dinner together and all you do is talk about the couple that's not there. And so that you can be wrong, you can be one the wrong way. You can have a marriage that is one and you're committed to the oneness, but there's bitterness and jealousy and envy and fighting going on. Uh, we, are, we are called to be one, but we're called to be one like Jesus and the Father and the Spirit are one. I, let me give you, this is a silly example. I'm gonna show you a video that is absolutely ridiculous. Well, it's part ridiculous and part not ridiculous. But I want you to see about, you know, we can become one over a lot of things and there's a right way to do it. Let's watch this day moving forward, okay, in our office, on this campus, but especially in this tent, I do not want anything that carries the Starbucks logo on this church property. You hear me? That is Lilith 1,000%. I've studied it. It is a demon. It is sexual deviance. I am done with Star. I've been done with Starbucks for a long time. It's communist coffee anyhow. You can, look, 
You can go and drink a gallon of Starbucks today. That's fine. Don't you bring in cups in this room. If I see it, I'm going to tell you to take it out. You hear me? I'm telling you, that company is not only one of the most godless companies on the planet. They are full-blown, 1,000% a witch's coven. I promise you it's the facts. I'll stake my life on it. Starbucks is witchcraft. Wow. Wow. That's, uh, we'll be selling Dunkin' Donuts coffee on the way out. Um, <laughs> if you do have a Starbucks coffee cup, uh, just keep it a little low. I, I didn't know that. that that's, that's what we're going to rally around, right? We're going to rally around our mutual stand on Starbucks. And let me just tell you, anytime you hear somebody says that I know it and I bet my life on it, they're already in a dangerous place. And then second of all, if 100% isn't good enough, you have to elevate it to 1,000%. Like 1,000% is more than 100%. You might be exaggerating something. But the thing is, is we can divide this congregation, the Church of Christ, on just about anything. I just didn't know we could divide it on coffee. And so we got to figure out how God wants us to be one. And I think Jesus gives us an example about what one looks, one looks like the right way. See, together is more than an idea. It's more than a concept. It's, it's more than a dream. It is... Together is a choice we step into. We make the choice to step in to get together. It's a great idea, and, it, and it's something that we want to be, and we hear the Father talking about that they may be one, but it is something that you and I have to make a choice. I'm not swatting your coffee cup out of your hand. I am not going to check whether or not you voted Republican or you voted Democrat in the last elections. This is about choosing to be together based upon the principles of Christ and the love of God, to be one as he is one. So, you know, when we think about church experiences, you know, maybe you were raised, I was raised Catholic, I went to Catholic parochial school. Um, I mean, that was nuns and priests. And, and when I was, because I was divorced, I wasn't allowed to receive communion. When it was time for communion time, I had to go up and do this. And so I wasn't allowed to receive communion unless I got an annulment. And it was a whole complication of things there. So there's um, a lot of us have had church experiences, good or bad. Um, I mean, it doesn't matter which denomination. It's just that we've all had experiences. So when we're kind of backing out maybe our experience, it's like, well, what do we back it out to? What is it supposed to look like? So we got a beautiful picture of what it looked like long before the holy wars ever happened. Long before Muslims and Christians were fighting each other trying to prove whose God was number one. We got this incredible picture, snapshot, as soon as it happened, as soon as the church is born, as soon as it, it, it's alive and visible, we get a snapshot of what together looks like and what were the elements of it. So the apostle Peter, Jesus is, uh, died on the cross, he rose on the third day and he talked to his disciples and showed himself to over 500 people. It wasn't something done in secret. A lot of people saw him risen from the dead. And then he stays, and then he ascends into heaven. And then on the day of Pentecost, he pours out his Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, you know, the church is born. And these disciples and followers of Jesus are just filled with the Holy Spirit. So Peter steps forward, and he begins to tell them, all the people that are bewildered, like, what the heck's going on? And he tells them what the kingdom of God's all about. And he kind of lays it out. And so that's where, so we're getting, this is fresh. I mean, this is just out of the oven biscuits. This is real good. We're going to get to see what church is supposed to look like. So let's pick it up in the second chapter of Acts. So then those who had received Peter's word were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. I don't know, I've, done some, I've had some pretty good messages in my life, and done a, a couple Sundays I've walked away from, you know, feeling a little bit, not bad, not a bad job at all, but this is something else. 3,000 people listen to Peter, and, and um, 3,000 souls are saved. Now, here's the thing. That's where most church experience ends, especially being in the Bible Belt now for 40 years, that's 
really, as a pastor, and I can speak for my profession, that we uh, kind of look at, how's your church going? We had 70 baptisms, Brother Paul. It's like, oh, really? Yeah, we had 105, not including children, give their lives to the Lord. And, and we kind of teach that's it. It's all about getting saved. It's all about going to heaven. And let me just tell you, that's some great stuff right there. And that's some necessary stuff. And baptizing is awesome, and that's part of the journey. But that's not, a, not enough to live on. See, it's enough to die with, but it's not enough to live with. See, if you were just going to get saved and baptized and, and then, you know, keel over, you know, those little cartoons where they draw that when you're dead and they put two X's in your eyes. You know, if you're all of a sudden just going to, and that's it, that's awesome. You're going to heaven, you know, not a bad, not a bad day's work. But what if you live? What if you live for 20 more years, 50 more years? Uh, going to heaven's awesome, but what about living life here? How do you do that? It's not enough to die with, but it, uh, it's enough to die with, but not enough to live with. So together is the choice that they decided to step into. So they get saved, they get baptized, and here's the next line. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. Many signs and wonders were taking place through the apostles. So remember, we're getting a pure shot. So I don't care how long you were Catholic. I don't care what Baptist church you went to. I don't care how long you've been speaking in an unknown tongue. I don't care about any of that. This is kind of a pure, untouched photo of what the church, what the intention of God is for the church. So first of all, it said they were continually devoting themselves. Now... I don't know if you've done a lot of continually devoting lately. It's kind of an interesting phrase, continually devoting. Um, and it means to be earnest towards, to persevere, or to be constantly diligent at. There's not a lot of things I'm continually devoted to. Oh, I like the Patriots, you know, New England Patriots. I liked them for like 20 years while they were winning Super Bowls. Right now, I think at halftime, they were losing to the Indianapolis Colts someplace in Germany. And so, you know, my devotion's kind of waning a little bit. You know, I may have a restaurant that you like, but, you know, you go to it a couple times in a row, and then you start, like, I want to try something new. We may be devoted to a particular brand of car, and it's like, I really, I like Toyota. I drive Toyota. And, and maybe our devotion is expressed in that kind of way. And, um, but that really doesn't seem to do enough for me. I, and so I'm always looking for a new word. I'm always kind of like trying to expand my vocabulary a little bit, kind of like when you get a new word, it makes you see something differently. And so I was thinking about constantly devoted. What does that mean? Like what, if you break it down, um, assiduous. I don't know how many times you've used the word assiduous today or doing something assiduously, but here's what assiduous means. Showing great care, attention, effort, marking by remaining unremitting attention or persistent application. It's like, wow. Now we're talking about more than continually devoting because that, like I said, there's a lot of things I kind of continually devote myself to, but it doesn't mean I throw my heart into it. But what they were doing was assiduously devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking bread, and to prayer. It's like, okay, that's, that's what this new, unblemished, untouched photo of church, Jesus' way, not America's way, not Bible Belt way, Jesus' way. This is what it looks like. So what is the apostles' teaching? Now, I found this really interesting because as somebody who is into systematic theology and the philosophy of the Christian faith and things like that. And when I begin to think about the apostles' teaching, I'm standing here in the 21st century looking at not only the, what the apostles taught, but Augustine, Aquinas. I'm looking at Calvin. I'm looking at all these great men and women of God throughout the ages. I'm looking at all the councils of the church and the doctrines of the Trinity and 
predestination and Calvinism, and, and I'm looking at all that. And so when I, I think about that, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. It's like, wait a minute. These guys had only been walking with Jesus for three years, and he's only been dead for like, uh, and, and up in heaven for about almost two months. How sophisticated could that be? So that's the great thing. It doesn't have to be sophisticated. It doesn't mean that you have to understand everything. It doesn't mean that you have to be into um, apologetics. It doesn't mean that you have to be into systematic theology. I love those two things, and I, you know, recommend them. They're awesome. Good analytical approaches to understanding the Christian faith from a rationalist standpoint. But that's not what they were doing. They were teaching, what did Jesus say? You were there, Peter. Peter, what did he say? What did he say about loving my neighbor? Oh, yeah, I let me tell you what, let me teach you what he said about that. Well, Peter, what did he say about loving people different than me? Peter, what did he say about forgiveness? What did Jesus do, John? Can you tell me what, what did he do? So he was in this situation, so they caught this woman in adultery, what? Yeah, yeah, what happened was they dragged her out here and they were about to stone her and then Jesus said, you who are out of sin. So, so when I talk about devoting yourself to the apostles' teaching, I'm not saying you should get anxious or worried about, I need to be a theologian. I need to read all these books about apologetics. You know, again, I love this stuff. It's like a hobby to me, you know, but that's not what they were teaching. They were teaching, what did Jesus say? What did Jesus do? And what did he tell us to do? But they assiduously devoted themselves to knowing Jesus. They were, they were totally into it. It said they were into the apostles' teaching and they were into fellowship. Now, this is the one I got the problem with. Um, you may not believe this, but I am technically an introvert. I'm only an extrovert between 9.15 and 12 o'clock on Sundays. Most of the time, I just want to be left alone. I want to be in a kayak on the Stono River all by myself with a fishing rod or a camera and call that living. But see, that's not what alone what God had called them to. He called them to doing life together. This is the part that kind of invades me a little bit, to fellowship, intentionally gathering together as learners and lovers and leaders. He's like, listen, here's what I want for you is I want you to be in relationship with other people. And so this may be the big challenge for us because I know as Americans, we love our individuality, our singleness. We like our, you know, staying in our zone, doing what we do, and we want everybody else to leave us alone. But it seems that Jesus wanted us to be one as he is one with the Father, that he wanted us to live and do life together. That's what the church looked like, people doing life together. Then it said they were assiduously devoted to the breaking of bread. Now, this is an interesting phrase, and it's kind of the way that it's kind of translated, the breaking of bread, because there's nothing intrinsic in this phrase that makes you think, there's two ways you can interpret this. This could be referring to eating a meal together. We just broke bread together up at the uh, coffee shop. Or it could mean the breaking of bread, the Eucharist, the body and blood of Jesus Christ celebrating the Lord's Supper. There's nothing in the Greek words that say, oh, he's referring to this. It has to be picked up out of context. So in this particular case, I believe because they were committing themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer, these are all kind of like lit church liturgical things. This was like, like how the church under approached its understanding of God. I mean, so it was, this is kind of, so when I think about this, that they were a group of people who were centered around the sacrament of grace and forgiveness. That that was like their meal. You know, like when I, I'm an, I come from an Italian family, and so when, you know, I go home to Boston, you know, there's this, there's this restaurant that's in my town that we go to, and it's an Italian restaurant. And when you get together with a bunch of other Italian people, there's, you know, you go to North Boston, you little, eat a little bit of Italian food, and, and so you're really into that. Well, it's like, like in the Christian faith, when we're doing life together, what do we eat? 
What is our flavor? And what our flavor is, is represented by the table of Christ. We live in the sacrament of giving grace and giving forgiveness, of, of taking grace and taking forgiveness from God. That's what they devoted themselves to. Can you imagine being in a group of people? Imagine being in a marriage where your primary meal is not the literal eating of the bread and the cup of Christ, but that you lived in the sacrament, the table of mercy, grace, and forgiveness. Man. And that's what I believe in this particular case he's saying is that when they came together, they recentered themselves. It's like, well, what kind of church are we? Are we a contemporary church or are we a traditional church? Are we uh, a liturgical church or, or, or are we a casual church? Or what are we? We dress up church or we dress down church? What kind of church are loud music, quiet music? It's like, no, we are a church that is centered around the sacrament of the table of Christ. Like that's together. That's what we are. That's, that's who we are. And that's what they committed themselves to. Were the other things they probably had conversations about, but they were, they were assiduous about this. Then it says they committed themselves and devoted themselves to prayer. Here's the reason why I don't like prayer. Um, I know some of you are like, this guy gets way, paid way too much if he doesn't like prayer. Uh, we need to cut his salary down a little bit. Uh, but here's why I don't like prayer. Is, uh, I love talking to God. I, like, I talk to God a lot. I mean, I, I really do. Um, I talk to God a lot. But I don't like talking to God together. One, it makes me nervous. You know, I don't want to say something stupid, you know. But here's the other thing is part of prayer is me asking you to pray for me. And for me to ask you to pray for me, what does that mean I have to do? I have to show weakness. And I'm scared of you because you could hurt me. I'm afraid of being vulnerable around people. You think I'm wearing this because I like wearing this collar up? No, I'm trying to look cool. I mean, I'm serious. I'm trying to look cool because I'm nervous that you won't think I'm cool. And you know what's crazy? I just got this old stupid T-shirt underneath here, you know? Uh, but it's like we do so much because we're afraid of one another. And they were the kind of group of people that would, committed to God, they were committed to fellowship, they committed to breaking bread, and they were committed to being in an environment where they were willing to admit, I am broken, I'm having a hard time, and I need you to pray for me. What does that make the church? The church is supposed to be the safest place on earth. It's the only place that you should ever go where you can't destroy yourself, no matter what you reveal about yourself. That, that is absolutely amazing. That I can go to a place where we're committed to prayer, not only lifting up God, getting to know God, but a place where I can tell you I'm scared to death or I lost my job or I just screwed up with my wife or you know, I'm having a difficult time believing in God or whatever it may be. And I can go to a group of people and say, listen, I don't know who my, I think I wanna die. Will you pray for me? That is what, the church, just as it came out of the oven, looked like. Listen to the story as it continues. And all those who had believed were together. See, it's not like all those who believed were done. You believed, you accepted Jesus, go ahead. It's like, no, it was, it's a run-on sentence. It's like all those who believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them all with all as anyone might have need. See, this is not just a Sunday morning moment. This was future moments. They were together in wealth. They were together in poverty. They were together in health. They were together in sickness. They were together in, in success. They were together in failure. They were committed together. They believed in God. They put Christ as this, the central sacrament of their fellowship, and they remained together and had all things in common, sharing with one and all as anyone might have need. That is what 
the church is supposed to look like. It continues, and, and it kind of like, it's kind of like it went from this church liturgy thing, like apostles teaching to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer, kind of like church stuff that we're used to. So this vertical kind of orientation, and now it begins to talk this horizontal orientation, that together is not just me and Jesus, it's me, Jesus, and others. So it says, and day by day, they were continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. They continued this daily. Let me ask you this. After today, you know, we're going to be done here in you know, 20 minutes or less. Um, do you just go the rest of the week on your own? I mean, is, is that it? I mean, tomorrow, who are you going to intersect with? Who, who are you going to uh, continue daily with? It doesn't have to be all of us. Uh, but is there somebody that's here, a friend of yours, somebody that you've met, somebody that you know, that you can continue with? Now, it may be a text message. It may be, hey, let's go get coffee. Um, it may be five of you in a small group. It may be, it, it may be more formalized. I, I don't know, but do you continue together? Most of us just go home, and it's like, well, that was Sunday. That was a good service. Wasn't it good? Yeah, well, it was a little long. Yeah, I didn't like that thing he was wearing. He didn't look cool at all in it. You know, it's like, okay. Um, but, or, and then that's it. And then, and then six days go by. And then we expect this moment to be so amazing that it's going to transform your life. Now, that's not the way it happened in the early church. In the fresh church, the one right out of the oven, they continued daily. They put aside their differences in honoring God. It says they continued in one mind. You know what? Continuing in one mind is not that everybody had everything in agreement and what they thought about, is they put aside their differences. I'm not in one mind with my wife. And I've been married to her for 36 years. I mean, I've got ideas about what we should watch. She's got ideas about what she, she would be watching these home decorating shows or the history of uh, Henry VIII. I mean, she just constantly, like on her phone, she's like, oh, who you learn about, uh, Mary, Queen of Scots? I'm like, who? You got any photos? You know, it's like, who is she? And it's like, she's always into this. And then I'm into other stuff. And I'm, she'll like, what you looking at? And I'll be like, you, you really want to see what I'm looking at? She'll be like, yeah, I really want to see what you're into. I'm looking, it's like, BF Goodrich tires. I want to put big tires and a lift kit on my, my vehicle. She goes, really? You spend your, oh, no, then I was looking at uh, Lionel, uh, Lionel uh, HO train sets this week. All week, looking at train sets for Christmas. Get a little train set and put it out there and all that stuff. See, one mind doesn't mean that all of us are just kind of like uh, clones of each other. No, when it's one mind is when I take my differences as a Republican and you take your differences as a Democrat and we lay them aside for the sake of the table of Christ because we've decided Christ is center, not America, not my political views, not the kind of coffee that I'm drinking, but I lay it aside and I join together with you in the table of Christ, one mind. That's how my marriage works. Yeah, we're two totally different people. But we choose. Together is a choice. It's not just a dream. It's something you have to choose. And these people were putting aside their differences to honor God. They were opening up their private lives. That's, this is the one that scares me the most. It's like, I like you. It's like, cool. Hey, you want to get together? Yeah, let's do it. Where do you want to meet up at the church? Let's meet up at the church. Well, I can come to your house. No, 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 no. Don't come to my house. It's like, no, nah, we're not like slaughtering cat, you know, animals over there, and I don't want you to see it. But I like my privacy, you know. But you know what these people did? It said they went from house to house, breaking bread. And in this context, it was probably meaning that they were doing a shrimp boil together or having steamed oysters, or they were um, just hanging out watching a Clemson football game or some other loser team that they could possibly be watching. <laughs> I mean, they could have been just, they, they were just sitting around. I mean, it's like they were doing life together. And I know for some of you, the thought of somebody being in your house or into your life, or you th we get that feeling like when you're on an elevator with somebody 
Have you, do you guys get that feeling like it's just the two of you on the elevator? And I'll be like, first of all, I'm looking to see if they got a weapon. It's my first thought that I'd make sure they've got a weapon. And then um, uh, I'll get like real nervous. And I'll be like, hey, hi. Did you ever notice that guy, Otis? It's like he certified all the elevators in the United States of America. I'm like, I would like to get to know this guy, Otis. Have you ever met Otis? I mean, if you look at an elevator, there's this one guy named Otis who has certified all the elevators in the United States. But you get that feeling of nervousness. And these people were willing to break through that. They started going to each other's houses. They started just having meals together. Not super, something super religious. Didn't say that they were all having studying cosmology or apologetics together. They were just having bread together. God loves that. They were bringing the commonality of Jesus to everyday life, and they were experiencing gladness and sincerity of heart. Don't underestimate the power of being in a group of people with gladness and sincerity of heart. What is sincerity of heart? The lack of pretense. No pretense. You know, wouldn't you like to be around a group of people where there's no pretense? You, you can be who you are, and you're still safe. That's the kind of people they were. So then, Acts chapter 2, verse 47, that whole line, he describes it, and then he's kind of telling us what happened. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. I think that's kind of amazing. Because, you know, your mom can invite you to church. And, you know, you can go through the yellow pages if you still believe in those things. If you can go into the yellow pages and you can look for a church and all this other stuff. But could you imagine that you had a church that was so awesome, so right on, on the money, on what God wanted it to be, it said that the Lord added to their number day by day, those who were being saved. You know, can you imagine God like he's driving through Charleston with an unsaved person and they're driving and he's like, where are you taking me? Oh, I'm taking the church, man. It's like, yeah, really? What, you want me to, uh, why? Well, I want you to get saved and I want you to learn about me and, and we're gonna do life together. Okay, well, uh, there's a church on the corner. He's like, yeah, not that one, not that one. It's like, you don't wanna add me to that one? No, not that one. So what about this one over here? I've heard it's been around for like a uh, hundred years that, uh, you know, uh, Calhoun went to church there. Yeah, not that one. You know, it's like, wait a minute, what kind of church are you gonna take me to? Oh, Pentecostal church, aren't you? Or a Protestant church, or a Catholic church. Well, where are you gonna take? He's going, no, I'm gonna take you to where there's a group of people that, that are assiduous about the apostles' teaching, about fellowship, about breaking bread, about prayer, about doing meals together, about doing life together. I'm gonna take you to the safest place on earth. That's, that's what Jesus did. He's like, I'll add you to this. Now, you may be like me, and you may wanna know what's the payoff going to be for this investment. Because I know, I, I just told you it's gonna invade your house, it's going to invade your, your introvertism, it's going to it's going to affect your usage of wealth and time, what you're gonna do daily, and what you value, what you're assiduous about. Um, so if you're like me, I'm a shrewd, skeptical, thinking Christian. Okay, there's Christians who are serving Christians. They just serve, they just love serving. You know, it's like, man, there's helping Christians, and they just love to help. And then there's thinking Christians. And we just like to think. We don't want anybody around us. We just want to think. We want to think lofty ideas about God. And, and it's like, well, and God's like, well, that's not, my, that's not my, the way I want church to be done. And so you may say, well, what's the investment in me opening up my life to other people? You know, obviously, when there's, you want to make more money, there are certain investments. When you want to get in shape, there are investments want better relationships, raising kids, mental wellness. There are all investments that we know about that we can make and we choose to make them or we don't choose to make them. So let me just say, when I look at an investment and the person that's trying to offer me this investment, uh, I look at what the person started with and what they're trying to get me to buy into. I do it with everything. So if you're trying to sell me on, you know, uh, 
a new kind of diet or something. I'm going to want to see what you look like before you started the diet. Now, if you were a little princess, you know, wearing yoga pants from the womb, and you're going to try to sell me about 35 pounds overweight on a, on, a, on a workout program, please excuse me if I don't pay attention. Because you never had a weight problem. I want to see a person with a weight problem. And all of a sudden, they got control of their diet. If you're going to come up to me and you're going to tell me how to invest $500,000, I'm going to not listen to you. Because I am nowhere near $500,000 in my life. If you come up to me and tell me about a new workout program uh, like CrossFit, <laughs> God bless you CrossFit people. Yeah, I know. It's like you're doing these cowbell things and swinging them around and you're jumping up on boxes because you'll do that. That's, you better be prepared because most of your life you'll spend jumping up on boxes. You know, so you'll be, you're jumping up on boxes and then you, you run around the parking lot a little bit with like some, some, something on your back. And then you get down, and then you got to do 30 deadlifts. Go, 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 go. And you say, Paul, you need to be doing this. Listen, what if? If I was in my prime, that may help me, but I'm not in my prime anymore. I, I pulled a muscle just saying those things out loud to you right now. If you come up to me and tell me, well, marriage is all about being a virgin and being pure before God, but I'm 45 and I just got a divorce, then I'm going to be like, I ain't investing because you didn't start at the same place I started. You're trying to get me to invest in something, but you and I aren't alike. So I'll check to see if it worked for everyone who fully invested. You know, I'll, uh, did it deliver what it promised? Um, did, it, did I misinterpret what was, going, was promised? So when I talk about doing this life together out of the investment of Acts chapter 2, we are shown what the buy-in is, but what's the payout? Um, is the payout going to be what you expect it to be um, or what you want it to be? Because I'll be honest with you, these people came to Jesus and walked away from a way of doing life, and I'm cool with that, but what's the payoff? Because you can't get an American to do anything without a good payoff. I want to be able to say that the payoff for you as pastor of this church, that if you do life together with us, you're going to be wealthier. Um, if you do church with us, you will have a great life. Your life's going to be amazing. It's going to be so much easier than, a, 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 how about this, that you should buy into doing life together because you will live to 105, guaranteed. You're going to live an old life. You know, um, but I have to be honest with you. That's not, that's not the payout. And I want you to know that up front. Because I have seen the righteous live with meager. I have seen the righteous die what I consider way too young. Um, so what is the payoff? What is the promise of doing life together? What is the expectation of living together following after God? So as a skeptic in my very nature, I'm like, okay, God, I can't, I can't lie to these people because you get lied to a lot by people like me. You know, we try to sell you on a thing and how it's going to bless you and how it's going to make you wealthier and it's all this stuff. We'll extract per pieces of scripture. Um, you know, most of these apostles, they died violent, young deaths. You know? So what's the payout? One, and, this, and these I know are true, a thousand percent. I know these are true from scripture. You will discover who God is, and that's a big deal. You will discover who you are by doing life together. You know, Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. And we're all like, oh, brilliant. But you know, 
he was still by himself. The problem Descartes had with that idea, he says, there, I think therefore I am, but that axiom only proves that I exist. It doesn't prove anybody else on the earth exists. What a lonely place to be. Finding yourself all by yourself will not discover yourself. It's when you do life with other caring, loving, truth-speaking people. You will live with the company of people who want the best for you. Doing life together, in weakness, you will find strength. In strength, you will find and develop empathy. In poverty, you will find treasure. In wealth, you will find and learn generosity. In confusion, you will find surety. In disillusionment, you will find purpose. In doubt, you will find truth. In happiness, you will find thankfulness. In success, you will find humility. In sorrow, you will find hope. In loneliness, you will find a friend. And in death, you will find life. This is what these people sold out to. This, this is worth investing in. Being assiduous about the brand of car you have will not give you all that. Being assiduous about what company you work for, being assiduous for your political party will not deliver those results. But doing life together in the body of Christ, all of those are yours. So, baptisms, salvations, winning souls, that's usually where it ends for most churches. That, that's all. It's all about if you die tonight, where are you going to spend eternity? My thing is, is, what if you don't die tonight? How will you live life? Will you live it alone? Will you scream in your house alone? Will you be sick alone? Will you be successful alone? Will you, how will you deal with the abuses that have happened to your life, the crimes that have been committed? Will you deal with those alone and in the shadows? Or will you find the safest place on earth where you can ask for help? Baptisms and salvations and winning souls are great stuff. It's enough to die with, but it's not enough to live with. So what do I need? You need together. And not just any together, a together that's committed to the sacred table of grace and forgiveness sacred table of Jesus. You need to be a part of a community that is one like he is one. So I know you're here and it could be the next, it could be another six days before I see you again. But will you be doing life alone? What will you be doing assiduously this week? Count your money? Counting your sorrows, pouring over an MRI, remembering the hurt that somebody did to you, or will you assiduously be growing in your relationship with God, devoted in relationship with other people? So as we go to the table of Christ, um, God wants you to maybe expand the way that you were thinking about church. And I am sorry if this church or any other church has lied to you. Um, it's not enough to just say you're Catholic. It's not enough just to say you're Baptist. It's not enough to just say you speak in tongues. There's so much more. What? That we may be one as he is one. Heavenly Father, we thank you that today 
we don't have to be in our prime. We don't have to be virgins. We don't have to be wealthy. That today we are invited into an investment that has already been made on our behalf. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Lord God, we all can invest in what has already been bought for us. Your love, your table, your church, your people, the safest place on earth. So Father, as I come and I eat the bread and I drink the cup, I'm not only reminded about your love for me, but I'm also reminded that this is a table. This is a people. This is more than an idea. This is a choice, loving one another. And today, I choose to step into together.